Today's topic is beta readers. And if you've got five minutes, I've got five tips to help you choose and use beta readers. When I started my writing career more than 35 years ago, there was no such thing as a beta reader. Actually, to be more precise, there was no such thing as the term beta reader. That term is relatively new, and if you've been plugged into the social media sphere with regard to writers over the last decade or so, you will have seen the term. You may have even used beta readers yourself. So if you've used beta readers in the past, then I have a question for you. Are you utilizing them as well as you possibly could? And if you've never used a beta reader before and you thought you might like to, do you know where to find them? So I've got five tips for you on those two topics. But before we get there, I want to make sure we all understand what a beta reader really is. Now these days we often see products, usually software, sometimes apps, sometimes even websites that are in what is called a beta form. This beta form is more or less a prototype of something. It is an unfinished product, a product for which the developer is looking for feedback. And you might sometimes be asked for uh, feedback on using a beta version, for example, of a website. They will get that feedback from you and they will make changes before the final version of the product or the website or the app comes out. So the use of the term beta itself is where the term beta reader comes from. Now here's my definition of a beta reader. A beta reader is a reader tasked with providing an author feedback on an as yet unpublished piece of writing. And one of the most important aspects of that definition is the term feedback. And also the other aspect of it, which is really important is as yet unpublished. And although the term itself is fairly recent, in fact, writers have been using beta readers for years. Tolkien famously asked his sons to read drafts of Lord of the Rings before it was published. They were beta readers for Tolkien. I also need to point out that oftentimes you will see that online that definitions of beta readers talk about using it for long form fiction only for novels, for example. But I happen to disagree that it's only for that. I think that you can you utilize beta readers very, very well for long form nonfiction, as well as short form nonfiction for short stories, magazine articles, even a blog post to get an, someone else's feedback on your work before you publish it. Another question that we should probably get out of the way before the five tips is when should you use a beta reader? Should you use it for a first draft? Absolutely not. A second draft? Maybe. When else in the process? Well, it depends on the process and it depends on you as a writer. There are no rules, but there are tips. There are some ways you can use them better. And here are my tips. Tip number one, decide up front what you want from your beta readers and clearly convey it to them. You need to be very clear with these people that you're going to ask to read a draft of your manuscript what you're looking for. Are you looking for broad, overall, blue sky kinds of comments? Do you want them to mark errors or do you not want them to mark errors? Do you want them to pay attention to inconsistencies in the manuscript? Be very clear with them about what you're looking for. And I would also recommend that you put it in writing, put it into an email to a beta reader. This is precisely what I'm looking for. Be very clear. Tip number two, understand that beta readers are not editors. Beta readers are not professional editors. Professional editors are editors, and it's their job to do it. It is not a beta reader's job to edit your work per se. You can take or leave what a beta reader says. You can't generally take or leave what your editor says. You could, but you do it at your peril, and it kind of depends on your relationship with your particular publisher. But remember that your beta readers are not editors. That's not what you're using them for. Tip number three. When you're seeking beta readers, consider family or friends, but be very, very cautious. Oftentimes, writers will ask members of their family or close friends to read their manuscripts for them. 
This might be a good idea, but it might be a very bad idea. You need to be really cautious here. First of all, you need to understand their capabilities. And don't ask someone uh, who is a friend or a family member if they're not really capable of providing the kind of feedback that you're looking for. And the second thing is, can they be honest with you? Sometimes a family member or a good friend is going to say, oh, this is wonderful, even if it's not wonderful. And that's not helpful to you. But also, can they be honest with their criticism? And can you accept that? Can your relationship withstand that? If you're not sure about it, pass on family and friends. Tip number four, beware of finding your beta readers from online writers groups. There's a bit of a debate about whether or not a beta reader ought to be a writer or a non-writer. And both have their, have their pros and cons. But on balance, I think that having a, another writer as your beta reader is probably not a best idea. It would be a second choice at best. Other writers who might come to your work as beta readers bring along a lot of baggage with them and they also bring hidden agendas. They're going to look at your work in light of their own work and that has a variety of outcomes. And one of those things could be that they might be harsh on your work because of competition. For example, they don't want you to be a competition for them, so they're going to be very hard on you. The second part of a fellow writer's hidden agenda might be that if they do a beta read for you, beta readers are generally not paid. Uh, if they're going to do that for you, they might expect you to do the same for them, and you may not be prepared to do that. So the bottom line here is that, in my opinion, an online writer's group is the absolute worst place that you can look to find a beta reader. But that's just my opinion. You can go ahead and do whatever you want. But to me, it's second, third, or fourth choice. Tip number five, start developing a thick skin. This is a good place for you to start developing a thick skin. Because beta readers are your first critics, and there are going to be people who are critical of your work all the way along the process. Of course, as you know, taking positive feedback is one thing, and doesn't it feel wonderful when a beta reader tells you how much he or she really loved your book, or how much a reader really loved your book? But the fact is that all that positive feedback, all that does is stroke your ego. It doesn't make your writing better. So when you get criticism from a beta reader, that's when you can begin to look at critically at your own work and decide how much of that you want to use, and it can only serve to make your writing better. Now sometimes, finally, as we look at this notion of beta readers, the question always comes up, do you need to have a beta reader for all of your writing? And the answer is no, you don't need to. And in fact, there may be times when it might be better for you if you didn't have them, but you'll know when those are. But if you choose not to use them ever, don't think that you're making a mistake with your writing. You're going to find other opportunities to get feedback on your work, but beta readers these days are one of the good ways that you can do it. So good luck with your writing, and I'll talk to you next time. Subscribe to Write, Fix, Repeat, and maybe I can help you improve your writing knowledge and skills. Five tips at a time.